Hey, welcome everybody. We're so glad you're joining us for our online worship. Saturn Road family, we love you and we look forward to this time each week. We've got friends around the country and even around the world who are joining us and you are so welcome. It's going to be a great time of worship together. Before we uh, go any further, I just want to tell you about a big day that's coming up in the life of our church. July the 25th, we're going to have our back to school supply giveaway. And even though we're in this COVID pandemic, we're still going to do it because God wants us to take care of each other. Now, I want to direct you to the online bulletin or our website for more information about how you can participate. You can buy supplies and bring them to the church building, or you can give money. And uh, a number of people have been doing either one of the two. And so we encourage you to be a part of it. It's going to be a great, great ministry to our community. On that same day, we're going to be uh, giving out VBS packets. Now, you know this year, and it's a really sad thing, we had to cancel our live VBS. But we've got quite a performance that has been put together celebrating 20 years of VBS. And on that day, the 25th, you can drive by and pick up a packet that's been prepared that will include a T-shirt, a DVD, and, and some games and some information that your whole family can participate in. So we want you to get that as well. So again, let me encourage you to check your online bulletin, go to the website, and you can get more information about these two really special events that will be taking place on July the 25th. Okay, one thing that's really important is that we stay connected with one another. And so in the next moment or so, what I'd like to encourage you to do is not only greet and hug the person that's physically by you right now, but also to take a moment, send a text, reach out by social media, and give somebody a virtual hug. It means a lot to people, and let me encourage you to do that right now.
praise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O Lord. Hello, Saturn Road family. What do you think about when you hear the word cure? I think about something that you take to get well. Cure is defined as a means of healing or restoring to health, like a remedy. As we yearn for healing right now in our nation during this crisis, we all, we all want a cure. Today I'm going to share with you the acrostic for cure. So when you think of this word, think about these things. The C stands for Christ. In Matthew chapter 20, there's a story of two blind men. They're on the roadside and they hear Jesus approaching them and they cry out to him, have mercy on us, have mercy on us. The, uh, the, crowd, the crowd rebukes these blind men, but they keep crying out, have mercy on us. And Jesus asked them a key question. What do you want me to do for you? So they want their sight back. That's what they want. They want to be cured of their sight. So Jesus, he has compassion for them, just like he has compassion for us. He touches their eyes and he heals them and immediately their vision is restored. The C stands for Christ. The U stands for unity. It doesn't take uh, very long to turn on the TV and see that our world is in complete chaos. Doctors, our leaders, they're fighting over whether or not uh, they, there is a cure. They're, they're, they're discussing about whether or not we should go back to school and when we should go back to school. People are marching down the road and protesting about something, about the injustices in our world. There's even name changes going on for our, our, our teams in sports. So we can see that the unity, there is none right now. What does the Bible say about unity? In John chapter 17, verse 21, Jesus says, May they all be one, just like you, Father, and me are one, right? And the Spirit, may they also be one in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. When there is no unity, perhaps we muddy up the waters, we muddy up the gospel message, we muddy up the message of salvation when there is no unity. The R stands for recovery. The Bible has so many stories of recovery. And we also read that there's, recovery isn't possible without prayer. There's a story in 2 Kings chapter 20 about King Hezekiah. He's told by the prophet Isaiah, you're gonna die, you need to get your house in order. So King Hezekiah, what does he do? He cries bitterly and he prays to God. And immediately God, he tells, he tells the prophet, hey, go back and tell Hezekiah that the message has changed. Tell him that he's going to, I'm going to extend his life by 15 years. God heard his prayer. He, 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 heard, he, he saw his tears and as a result, Hezekiah was recovered. And uh, he also delivered him from the Assyrians as well he and his people. And finally, the E stands for eternal. Perhaps everything that's going on around us right now is, is, is a reminder that this world is a temporary place that we live in. Uh, and, and because it is temporary, 
we see things like pain. We see death all around us because of this virus. Um, we, we see injustices. All of these are a reminder that we're in a temporary place. I like this version of the message in John 14, verse 2. It says, there is plenty of room for you in my father's home. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going back to prepare a room for you to get it ready? And if I'm on my way to get your room ready, I'll come back and get you so that you can live where I live. So when you remember the word cure, think about Christ, think about unity, think about recovery, and think about eternal. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are and for your love, for your grace and your mercy. We do believe, dear God, that you are the cure for everything in our lives. And we're so grateful for Jesus, dear God, for the compassion that he had while he was on this earth, the compassion uh, to, to heal people, the compassion that he, that he yearned uh, for, for those that were hurting, those that were in pain, those that were searching for something to be, to be filled with. And we're so grateful that Jesus was the answer and that he is the answer today for us. Dear God, we do pray for, for, for healing of our nation. We pray for unity in our land. And, and we, we all want to, to see things improve. And dear God, we know that recovery is gonna be possible, but we have to pray just, just like Hezekiah prayed, dear God. We have, to learn, we have to yearn, and sometimes we have to cry, dear God, but you listen and you hear our prayers. And we ask you at this time, dear God, that you provide solutions, that you help us, dear God, to be unified in the truth. And most of all, dear God, that we can walk a path, dear God, that people will be able to see that despite everything that's going on around us, dear God, that we believe that you have prepared a place for us. And we, and we want to be there one day with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let us adore, Let us adore the ever-living God. Set out the heavens, set out the heavens and establish the earth, and establish the earth, and whose glory, and whose glory is manifest throughout all the earth. He is our God. He is our God. Good morning, church. It is good to be with you today, and we are now entering 
a time of communion. Communion serves many things for us. It's one of the most impactful, important times as a church gathering. And some of the things that we think on and reflect on are things like this. That Jesus' sacrifice is for everyone. We remember and we reflect that Jesus rose from the grave and defeated death in his resurrection. We reflect on that Jesus is with us today through his Holy Spirit. But more than anything, it's a reminder for us that Jesus is king, he is Lord over all, and the Lord reigns. In a time where no institution really knows what to do with COVID, the Lord reigns. In a time where we look out and we see that there's a group of people that have been mistreated repeatedly, and we don't really know what to do going forward, we need to remember that the Lord reigns. Whenever there are individuals that are lost and they don't know what to do, they don't know how to get their life back towards God, we need to remember that the Lord reigns. For family situations, for any group of people where things start to fall apart, we know that Jesus reigns, that the Lord reigns. I'm not saying all this to diminish our concern or the hardships that we're going through, but I say all this to say that the King, that the Lord over all things, he loves you and he is working towards us being close with him. And that's more important than anything else that's going on. So I'm going to read from Psalm 97 and it's talking about how just important it is that the Lord reigns. Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. If you notice, it talks about how really all of creation has reason to celebrate and to be comforted because Jesus is king. Continuing on. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world for the earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all people see his glory. We know that nothing can hold back Jesus. We know that the evils of this world, sin, Satan's best efforts, really has nothing on Jesus. He defeated the scariest thing that is facing us, and that's death. There's no situation that the Lord that we are at at the table with, that we are in communion with, Nothing can actually stop what he wants to do. Continuing on in verse 7. All who worship images are put to shame. Those who boast in idols worship him, all you gods. It's so easy for us to get distracted, to get wrapped up in ourselves, to not be focusing on him and to not live our lives for him. Thankfully, the Lord is very patient and he's helping us come back to him. Continuing on, Zion hears and rejoices, and the villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments, Lord. For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. When you actually slow down to consider who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what he's doing for us right now, you can't help but be awestruck and to be amazed by how good he really is. It talks here about how Zion rejoices and the villages of Judah are glad. Anyone who knows Jesus, and even whenever you just experience him just a tiny bit, you walk away awestruck and you want to worship him because the Lord reigns and he deserves our praise. Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light shines on the righteous and joy on the upright in heart. I think one of the most important parts of communion is also remembering that as Jesus loves you and me as individuals, that he's forgiven us for all of our sins, he's also done the same for our brothers and sisters. So as we recognize that he is Lord and that he reigns over all things, one thing that we need to keep in mind and to do is that we need to also love each other the way that he loves us. So that means forgiving one another, 
appreciating one another and recognizing that everyone brings worth and can bring praise to Jesus, who is our King. This Psalm 97 ends by saying, Rejoice in the Lord, you who are righteous, and praise his holy name. We are not worthy of his love. We are not worthy of being at the table with him. We are not worthy of being in relationship with Jesus. But he is so good. He forgave us all the nonetheless. He went to the cross for all of us. And that is something that we should be reflecting on. His love and that he is over all things. And that we are all in him. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for loving us the way that you do. As we take this bread, I pray that we remember just what he did for those who are in him, the body of Christ. I pray that we honor you by how we love each other and that we help one another and that we pray for one another to realize what life is all about, and that's Jesus. Thank you again, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. God, thank you for today. We continue this prayer just awestruck by how good you are to us. God, as we go through a time of communion, we remember the blood that was shed for us and that it was perfect blood. It was the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God. I pray that we become more willing to sacrifice ourselves for you but that we also uh, give up everything that hinders us and slows us down from being close to you and trying to live for your will and not our will. Thank you for forgiving us, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed morning. I am a sheep and the Lord is my shepherd, watching over my soul. My soul to keep guarding over me ever, watching wherever I go. shelter and when I'm lost and alone he rescues me and when the lion comes he is my victory constantly watching over me he is constantly watching over me we are his children and he is our father watching over our soul great is his love for his sons and his daughters watching wherever we go and when the winds blow my shelter, and when I'm lost and alone, he rescues me, and when the lion comes, he is my victory, constantly watching over me, he is constantly watching over me.
Hey everybody, so glad that you're with us today for worship and, and uh, it's been great so far and we want to spend a little time in the Word and we're in a series that we began last week which is really looking at some stories out of the Old Testament but it's driven by this point that Paul makes in Romans chapter 15 in verse 4 where Paul says, for everything that was written in the past and for him that would be uh, the Old Testament was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So what Paul is saying is, go to the Old Testament, study those stories, think about them, and let them teach you, let them challenge you, and let them encourage you, and the end product will be hope. And you know what? I can't think of a time where that is more needed than right now. I was visiting with some church leaders the other night, and we talked about how we've never been through anything like this in our lifetimes. And what do we do? And how do we do it? And things are changing so fast. You know that in our world. But there's one thing that doesn't change, and that's God. And we read about him and how he relates to us when we read scripture, and particularly these stories in the Old Testament. So last week we talked about David and Goliath, and today I want to take you to 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to learn about this guy named Naaman. And I, I just want to look at his story quickly, and there are three things that encouraged, challenged me that came out of the story, and I'd like to share those with you quickly uh, this morning. So if you're ready, I want to read the first seven verses of 2 Kings chapter 5, and, and I want to read out of the message translation. That was written by Eugene Peterson, and that'll kind of give us some background into this story and help us understand a little bit about Naaman. So here's how it goes. Naaman was general of the army under the king of Aram. He was important to his master, who held him in the highest esteem because it was by him that God had given victory to Aram, a truly great man, but afflicted with a grievous sin disease. It so happened that Aram, on one of its raiding expeditions against Israel, captured a young girl who became a maid to Naaman's wife. One day, she said to her mistress, Oh, if only my master could meet the prophet of Samaria he would be healed of his skin disease. Well, Naaman went straight to his master and reported what the girl from Israel had said. Well, then go, said the king of Aram, and I'll send a letter of introduction to the king of Israel. So off he went, taking with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothes. Naaman delivered the letter to the king of Israel. The letter read, When you get this letter, you'll know that I have personally sent my servant Naaman to you. Heal him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he was terribly upset, ripping his robe to pieces. He said, Am I a god with the power to bring death or life that I get orders to heal this man from his disease? What's going on here? That king's trying to pick a fight. That's what. So, there's a little background into the story of Naaman. It's interesting, isn't it? What's going to happen? We'll read that in just a moment. But, but just to kind of summarize, Naaman is a five-star general. That's kind of the way we would view him. He is a powerful man, and he is well-liked, even loved by his king in Aram. And, and so everything is really great for Naaman, except he has this skin disease. And most translations will tell you it's leprosy. And that's really, in some ways, a death sentence. And during that time, there wasn't anything you could do. Uh, it was just a terrible, terrible disease to have. And so we find out about this young girl that was 
kidnapped on a raid to Israel, and she's serving Naaman's wife, and she, to her credit, speaks up and says, look, I know somebody in my homeland, Israel, that could take care of this problem. He's a prophet, and if you'll go to him, he can help. And so that's exactly what Naaman does. And the king sends this letter to the king of Israel and and has all these gifts. Uh, I mean, it's unbelievable how much stuff he brought with him as gifts to the king. But when the king hears this, because the letter basically says, heal him, heal my servant Naaman. The king says, well, I, I, I can't do that. I'm not God. I, I can't give life or take life like, like, like that. And he really believes that there's an ulterior motive here, and that is he wants to create a war. He wants a reason to go to war with me. So he is distressed. And then we pick the story up, beginning at verse 8. So I want to read out of my Bible, beginning at verse 8, and maybe you've got yours open as well. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Now watch this. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and he said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And so that's the story. That's how it ends. Now, let me share with you three things that I learned. And I want to remind you, Paul says, hey, go to the old scriptures. Look at them. Look at the stories. Read them, but also think about them. And what I love about the Bible, folks, I got to tell you, is every time I go back to scripture with an open mind and an open heart, God shows me something new. I learn something. I'm reminded of something. I'm stirred. I'm challenged. I'm encouraged. And I have hope. So I want to share three things that I I pick out of this story that I hope will encourage, challenge, and give you hope as well. First is this. Faith, or you might say God's plan, doesn't always make human sense. So when Naaman goes to the prophet Elisha, Elisha doesn't even go out to him himself. He sends a servant. And he says, here's what you need to do. Go dip or wash seven times in the River Jordan. And when you do that, you'll be clean. Now think about it for just a moment. You travel a long distance, you're a man of power and prestige, and you show up and you're told, 
Here's what you do. Go dip in the river seven times. Well, uh, you know, that sounds strange almost. And that's not what Naaman expected to hear. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 11, Naaman says, well, I thought that he, the prophet, would surely come out to me and would stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Now that's really interesting. Naaman had already predetermined what this was going to look like, what, what the healing was going to look like. And I can relate to that. And I suspect that you can as well. Often I face my own leprosy, as it were, my own problem, my challenge, and, and I talk to God about it, but I've already formulated the plan that God is going to use to take care of my problem. Can you relate to that? I've already got it figured out how God is going to do this, how he's going to, to take care of the situation. And then I'm reminded by God himself in his word. I absolutely love Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. And God is speaking, and I say I love this passage. I have to be honest with you, I don't always submit to it, but I love it. And God says, for my thoughts, and I hear him saying this to me, hey Jeff, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And hey Jeff, neither are your ways my ways? You see what God is saying there? You may think, you and I, we see things the same way. That we think the same way. That our plan of action is always the same. But he's saying to you and to me, don't think that way, because if you do, you're going to miss me, because my thoughts and my ways are not always like yours. And there's one big reason. He's God, and I'm not, and neither are you. And so his thoughts and his ways are so much higher, and the truth is, so much better than ours. I, I believe that sometimes we think our way out of faith and consequently out of God's blessings. Let me say that again. I, I believe that sometimes we think our way out of faith. Well, I thought we're like Naaman. Here's how it was going to happen. This is how I constructed it in my mind. And it's not turning out that way. So we think our way out of faith. And when we do that, then we move away from receiving God's blessings. I look back on my life, and I have to be honest with you and admit Far too many times, if you and I were to sit together over a Diet Coke and talk openly about this, I could tell you many stories in my life where because, because I thought, like Naaman, this is how you're going to answer God, this is the way you'll do it, that I thought myself out of faith and trusting God, and consequently, I didn't do what he called me to do, and I missed the blessing. I just have to be honest and confess that to you, and I don't want you to do that, and I don't want to do that anymore. I just need to understand that sometimes what he calls us to do, the answer is not always going to make human sense to us. A second thing that I learn from this passage, and it challenges me, it encourages me, is that 
Faith requires humility. C.S. Lewis, in his classic book, Mere Christianity, said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man, he says, is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. So Naaman, he's a five-star general. He's a powerful man. He's obviously a wealthy man. And he's a proud man. I read this story for a long time before it hit me. What God was really trying to do here was not simply heal Naaman, wasn't simply to bless him, but to teach him that the way to a dynamic relationship with God is through humility. That's critical. I love what James says in James chapter 4 and verse 10. This concept of humility is all over Scripture. But, but James, the reason I love this passage so much is he just kind of cuts to the chase. He says, James chapter 4 and verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord. Humble yourselves before the Lord. It's that simple. And then he says, and he, the Lord, will lift you up. I like to visualize scripture. And so the way I see that is, I, I don't come into my relationship with God saying, well, look at me, you know, I'm a five-star general and I've got all of this money or I've got all of this education or I've been able to do this or that. I, I don't come into my relationship with the Father and bring and tout all of my, you know, all of my goodness. James says, I come in bowing. I, I'm, I'm bending the knee to God. And then James says, in that relationship with God, now watch this, then what he does is he extends his hand and he says, now stand up. I humble myself before him, and he lifts me up. You see, with Naaman, God knew this wasn't going to work unless he humbled himself. And so the reaction when he shows up at Elisha's place, Elisha doesn't come out, and that really bothered Naaman. Well, I thought he would at least come out because look at who I am. I'm due that kind of respect. And then to tell me to go wash and dip seven times in the river Jordan. You know, he talks about the rivers in his country, Abana and Farpar. And he said, the waters are much cleaner there, much prettier there. You know, if, if this is what I've got to do, then why didn't I just stay home and I'll dip in my own ponds, so to speak? What's talking there? Pride. And I'm sure he thought, you know, this is ridiculous. I've come all this way. I brought all of these gifts. And you're going to tell me the answer is to go dip seven times? The more I read Scripture, the more I'm convinced that the number one thing God wants me to bring to the table as far as my relationship with him is concerned is humility. Humility. Because faith requires humility. Pride will shut down faith quicker than anything else in your life. And humility, on the other hand, will open up avenues for God to move in and through your life like nothing else. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, 
Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Now, I've read that passage a long time. And just recently, man, it just jumped out at me. And it's verse 7. The reason for all of this, God clearly allows something very difficult to happen in Paul's life. It's described as a messenger of Satan. God allows this to happen. And so there has to be a purpose for it. And I guess I had just read past this for years. But in verse 7, Paul says, the reason all of this is happening is so that I do not become conceited. Well, what's he saying? So that I don't become proud, arrogant. Or another way to put it is, God is doing all of this so that I will stay humble. And why is that so important? And Paul is wrestling through this, and he begs God to take away what he calls the thorn in the flesh. And God says, I'm not going to do that because my grace is sufficient for you. Because my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, I'll give you what you need to get through the pain, the difficulty that is in your life right now, but it is serving a very important role in your life, and that is to keep you humble. And you see, that principle, that idea, is true in our lives as well. It was true with Naaman. Let's just be blunt about it. Had God not humbled Naaman, Naaman never would have been cured of his leprosy. Because it takes humility to have faith. And faith is what leads to the blessings of God. Well, there's one more thing that I wanted to share with you out of this story, and here it is. Faith requires obedience. Faith requires obedience. So, God's ways are not always our ways. And sometimes the way God moves and his answer to our life situations or what he calls us to do may not make human sense. And in order to receive that, we must have faith. But faith, faith requires us to be humble. John Bunyan, in that classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, he says this, What God says is best, is best though all the men in the world are against it. I love that line because it applies to Naaman. So Naaman, man, he's upset. I thought you would do it this way, and you're doing it completely different. You're showing me no respect, Elisha. I deserve some respect. And there's that pride. And he gets angry, and he walks away. But here's the deal. He gets angry in all of his pride, and he walks away. But he walks away still a leper. But thankfully, he's got some servants. And I really appreciate the wisdom of these servants. And they come to Naaman and they say, Sir, hey, listen, if the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, you know, just some really stupendous thing, you would have done it, right? And Naaman says, well, yeah, of course. So then they say, well, why not 
do what he told you to do and go wash seven times in the River Jordan. In other words, what have you got to lose? And to his credit, some humility begins to sink into his life. And that's what he does. Now, I love to visualize scripture. And in this story, when we get to this point, I can see it in my mind's eye. Can you? They're at the River Jordan, and Naaman dips the first time, and he comes up out of the water. He still has the skin disease. He's still a leper. He dips the second and the third time and the fourth time, and he comes up. He's still a leper. He dips the fifth time and even the sixth time, and he comes up still has the skin disease. And he finally dips the seventh time, just like the prophet told him to do. And this time when he comes up out of the water, and I love the way scripture describes Naaman, his skin is clean. It's as clean as a young boy's skin. Now, What's so important about that? Let me tell you. It's found in the word obedience. Faith requires obedience. Faith actually leads you to obey. Humility is in the mix. When you're humble, you're going to live by faith, and that's going to lead you to do what God tells you to do, to obey. Now, can we be candid with each other? We're living in a time where obedience, man, that's not a popular topic. Maybe it never has been. But but we don't like somebody telling us what to do, and especially if it doesn't line up with our preconceived ideas. But it is paramount. You can't overstate how important it is in our relationship with God. And I'm not talking about partial obedience. Have you noticed in the church, a lot of us are good at partially obeying God. We kind of give a nod to what God says, or we we do it halfway. But I want to tell you, Naaman could have dipped three times, five times. He still would have been a leper. He could have dipped six times. He still would have had the skin disease. It wasn't until he did, listen to me, exactly what the prophet told him to do. It wasn't until then that he was healed, that he was blessed. Man, there's got to be a message for us in that. We're going to be blessed by God when we are obedient, by faith, by trust, by humble lives, doing exactly what God tells us to do. But you see, the Bible is telling us, and I go back to Paul's statement in Romans 15, to challenge us, to encourage us, to teach us, to give us hope. The Bible is saying, obey God all the way. And good things will happen. So as we close, can I challenge you? And maybe I can do it by asking you, are you obeying God? Are you fully obeying God? Are you honestly walking humbly by faith? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this story of Naaman. And we love how you worked in his life and you brought humility to him. And by faith, obedient faith, you blessed his life. We're thankful for Paul and his understanding of how important it is to be humble. And even that you allowed some painful things in his life to keep him humble so that you could keep blessing him. 
And I pray we will learn and that we will embrace those lessons in our lives. I pray for everyone that's listening to this message. Please, God, help all of us to fully obey you. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord O oh my soul O oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before O oh my soul I'll worship your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul. I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. I'll worship Your holy name. Worship your home.